So now I'd like to uh, introduce my colleague um, uh, and uh, Professor Paul Dimitri, the Professor of Child Health Technology based at the University of Sheffield, who will now talk to us on artificial intelligence and growth disorders, the opportunities and challenges. Thank you, Paul. Thanks very much, Justin. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I'm going to be speaking to you about artificial intelligence and growth disorders. So hopefully you can hear me now. Um, so I'm going to be speaking to you about artificial intelligence and growth disorders. I just need to wait for the controls. There we go. So uh, there's my faculty disclosure. <clears throat> and here are the learning objectives as have been presented to you by Justin. So before we start to look at artificial intelligence and growth disorders, what we need to do is really understand what artificial intelligence is. And here is a, a definition that I have put together uh, based upon a number of def different def definitions. But the important thing here about artificial intelligence is that it simulates human intelligence, but uses algorithms, data, and compu computational power. And the, the goal of AI is to perform tasks that would typically require human intelligence. So those tasks such as learning, reasoning, problem solving, perception, lang language, and understanding. And artificial intelligence, albeit that seems relatively new to us in society, and we are all using artificial intelligence now, even though sometimes we don't realize it, artificial intelligence in terms of the concept and the process has been around for over 70 years, starting with the Alan Turing test, Alan Turing was a British mathematician that deciphered the German Enigma codes, who actually coined the term the Turing test, which was based upon the fact that if a machine could trick a human into thinking that the machine was actually in hum human itself, then it has intelligence. And the terminology artificial intelligence was coined back in 1956 by another scientist, John McCarthy. And then there was a series of steps that happened that where artificial intelligence developed, but it went through a relatively fallow period, what was called the winter of artificial intelligence from the mid 60s through to the late 90s. And then since then, there has been an explosion in that technology to this, the subsequent use of the type of technologies that we're familiar with today, such as Amazon Alexa, ChatGBT, and IBM Watson. <clears throat> So we can categorize artificial intelligence into three progressive steps, starting with narrow intelligence, which is where we are in society at the moment. So this is essentially one specific task or area, and this is how artificial intelligence works at the moment, that it is data-driven, data is input into an algorithm, and then there is a task-orientated output from that particular process. So that's narrow AI, or what's also known as weak AI. We'll eventually move on to artificial general intelligence, which is where a computer starts to become as smart as a human. So we're not thinking in terms of speed because artificial intelligence is already faster in terms of human processing, but it starts to develop cognitive function. It starts to understand emotion better and starts to learn from its own behavior. And then an area which is probably decades and may not even be achievable is artificial superintelligence, where the machine actually has its own conscious. It starts to think about its own actions, its own thoughts, and it starts to process based upon experience, based upon other people's experience and its interaction with the general environment, what some people term as a dystopian future. And so on the left-hand side, you see that that categorization of artificial intelligence is based on capabilities, but it can also be categorized based on functionalities. So where we're at the moment is as far as limited memories. So Reactive machines is the first stage of artificial intelligence, which is essentially data in, algorithm, task L. So an example of that would be if you watch Netflix or Amazon Prime, uh, an artificial intelligence platform learns about your preferences and then it starts to give you suggestions based upon your preference of what you might want to watch next. An example of limited memory is a little bit further where the machine starts to learn about the environment around and then starts to help you make decisions on what the environment is, not just the task itself. So an example would be uh, a, a self-driven car where it, its task is to drive, but it's also processing information about the environment and then starting to learn from that environment as how to maneuver a car in a specific circumstance. 
And then in the future with that super intelligence and general AI, we'll see self-awareness where the machine starts to learn about its own actions and theory of the mind where it develops an independent cognitive function. And artificial intelligence is already used widely in healthcare. And here on your screen are some examples of where it's used. Precision medicine, accelerating drug discovery, robotic surgery, customer service chatbots and remote monitoring. And you can read there all the different applications. And you could also go online and read more about artificial intelligence in healthcare. It's already widely used and already widely supporting uh, healthcare in this present day. So another area that has become popular in medicine is generative AI. So generative AI is about taking something that is relatively simple and improving its output. So an example here would be medical imaging, where you have a low resolution medical image and AI can translate that into a high resolution image uh, based upon inference and understanding of what should be there. Generative AI is also used in drug discovery. So whereas previously we've had to utilize patient populations to trial different drugs, now we can set up artificial systems by which we can trial different compounds in an artificial environment, not involving patients, and understand what the potential reactions and outputs are based upon trialing that, that drug in what essentially is termed a digital twin, a computerized version of a human. It's used in personalized medicine. I'm going to talk a bit about this later, about bringing in data from various sources to personalize healthcare in a way that meets the specific needs of an individual. And then it can be used at a population level in terms of gathering data to understand potentially things like virus outbreaks or how populations will respond in different circumstances and in different environments. So AI is becoming a particularly important tool in the management of healthcare in different settings from a personal level right the way through to a population level. So here are some examples of where artificial intelligence has been used in growth disorders. So this is a study that uh, was published back in 2013 and again exemplifies the use of AI over 10 years ago now. So this is this is in Finland. The 98% of the, the Finnish population undergo, undergo a growth monitoring program and they undergo 20 height measurements from birth up to 12 years. What ha happens in the standard growth monitoring, as you can see in the top left, and has been used as the platform from 2005 to 2008 as a comparator, is that a nurse determines the height against the population reference, the distance from the final target height, that being adult height, and the growth rate. And based upon the output of that, the patient is referred if there's concern about a growth disorder. <clears throat> Between 2008 and 2009, an automated growth monitoring program was incorporated into the electronic patient record. And there were two further steps. Once that data had been processed, a long, longitudinal data was analyzed by an algorithm within the patient's electronic health record. And then subsequently, a further digital step was put in where there was no, any abnormal growth values were transferred electronically to, the, to a pediatric endocrinologist. And then they subsequently transferred back to the primary care physician to refer the patient in if there were real concerns about a growth disorder. And what you can see from the bottom line there that actually what that did was increase the diagnostic yield of diagnosing patients with growth disorders from what was essentially 0 0.1 per, th per thousand screen children in the years of standard growth monitoring to 0 0.9 per thousand, uh, 1,000 screens in the automated growth monitoring year. So artificial intelligence has increased the ability in that process to pick up children with growth disorders. <clears throat> Here is something that you'll be very familiar with, but maybe not aware that artificial intelligence is used in this situation. So AI is now being used to predict bone age, and it's built into a number of different platforms, including Bone Expert, and has been trialed in a number of different settings with an accuracy of between 85 to 95% uh, of predicting bone age within the age range of 1.5 to 18 years. And the most accurate methods uh, of predicting bone age have been as close as predicting bone age with, between 4.3 to four and a half months. The challenge with this is that the data sets, the training data sets for AI, how you train the algorithm to understand what to look for are based upon the predictions given by radiologists. So that has the, the risk of running a, a bias based upon what the radio, radiologist's opinion is based upon the data that is used as a training set. <clears throat> 
I'm going to talk a bit about facial recognition because this is still in the research field, but I think in the next 10 years or so will become mainstay in helping us with diagnosing patients, particularly with growth disorders. So facial recognition in terms of a process works quite simply by a pre-processing uh, step, which involves taking a photograph and the machine processing that photograph ready for analysis. It detects the face and then what it looks for is features, multiple features within the face that allow it to determine what a potential face looks like and then it starts to classify based upon that set. And that is based upon a training set. You have to train an AI algorithm to perform. So it has to have normal data as well as abnormal pictures to be able to understand what looks like normal and what, what is abnormal to be able to successfully make a diagnosis. So here's an example of a study or two studies from uh, similar groups back in 2018 and 19 where this was looking at automatic detection of, of acromegaly from facial photographs using a number of different machine learning methods. So you can see on the left-hand side, this is the training process. So you train the AI algorithm to understand what a normal face looks like and what the face looks like of a patient who is acromegalic. The machine detects the face, it then extracts the facial features and it does a goes through a process called facial frontalization. And what that means is, is it take, takes the facial features creates an automated 2D image, turns the face to a flat or frontal picture, and then recreates a 3D image. And it's remarkably effective in doing that. It, that you then put the data in of patients that where you're looking for an abnormality, and the machine determines whether the face looks more like a normal face or an acromegalic face. And there are a number of different uh, algorithms to do that. And you can see them there, support vector machines, convolutional ne neural networks, uh, and random tree. And what you can see from this, this study is that it's remarkably accurate at detecting uh, patients with acromegaly, but interestingly, more accurate than neuroendocrinologists that were specialized in pituitary disease and uh, families with, with acromegaly. So potentially useful to aid diagnosis in the future. Another study has done this with Cushing syndrome. Again, you can see the facial map there where, where the uh, computer is extracting different uh, areas of the face, and the software correctly identified patients with Cushing's, uh, correctly classified uh, pa patients with Cushing's to an order of 85% and 95% of controls, in other words, those without Cushing's. What was interesting with this study is when you only use patients that were obese rather than broader numbers with um, that were of varying weights, the accuracy of the algorithm diminished because it was struggling to determine differences between Cushing's and those with nutritional obesity. <clears throat> and here is uh, some examples of AI facial recognitions and other applications. So Noonan syndrome, Turner syndrome, and fetal alcohol spectrum. And you can see relatively large data sets, but what's interesting here is the number of facial features that are used within these algorithms. So you can see the fetal alcohol spectrum as an example, this is using 76 frontal and 39 lateral facial features through a technology called face to gene which is publicly available now. This is not a research tool, it's used in clinical practice, which uses a, um, a process called um, FDNA technology. And that can de detect a fetal alcohol spectrum with a sensitivity of 79% and a specificity of 78%. And AI has also been used for the detection of central precocious puberty. So in the first study here, you can see the data set of 966 females. These were females with precocious puberty, but the training set was 1,757 females that either had or didn't have uh, central precocious puberty based upon GnRH stimulation tests. So this is looking at retrospective data. What you then do is then create a training set in which 80% of the patients were put into the training set. And then the training set was tested with 20% in the test set. So 20% of that 1,757 patients were in the, the test set. And what the uh, AI models done in there, you see random forest and HG boost that there was the model had an ability using 19 different variables within the algorithm to detect uh, central precocious puberty with a sensitivity that was near to 80 percent and the three variables that showed the highest predictive value were the baseline lh fsh and igf1 
And the st second study there, a similar model used to predict uh, GNRH simulation tests. So in other words, used to predict the outcome of precocious puberty, first using the clinical cutoff of uh, five international units per liter in the GNRH stimulation test and a peak cutoff of 10 international units per liter, which was actually based on insurance data for uh, a referral basis for treatment. And again, three different models were used in this case, uh, logistic regression, so for logistic regression, random forest, uh, light uh, gradient boosting machine, and the XG boost, and the LG, light, L, uh, light GBM was found to be the model that was best at predicting um, the central precocious puberty with a sensitivity of uh, 95%. What the important take home message here is that putting large number of variables into the algorithm, that you have a high predictability of central precocious puberty before you've done a GNH stimulation test. So what you may be able to do with this AI algorithm is to be able to identify those patients that are most likely to have central precocious puberty and therefore target your GNRH stimulation test to that particular patient group. Here is another AI um, algorithm that was used to predict the response to growth hormone treatment in patients with Turner syndrome. These are uh, data that was put in over one year and then three years, and the model predicted that chronological age and bone age were the two highest predicting variables of the response to growth hormone treatment in Turner syndrome in the first year. But then when subsequently a similar, uh, the same artificial intelligence algorithm was used to predict uh, growth over the uh, three years from baseline. In fact, it was delta height SDS in the first year and chronological age. And then subsequently, the difference between bone age and chronological age were the three highest predicting values according to the algorithm to be able to predict uh, growth hormone response uh, in Turner syndrome. And I'm now just finally going to talk about clinical decision support before I talk about the uh, challenges with artificial intelligence. So we know that there are there is a growth hormone device now that will provide clinical decision support from uh, using uh, from gathering patient data around growth hormone injections and adherence. That carries an advantage to doctors in supporting patients with uh, using uh, an online connect platform to be able to predict the response to uh, growth hormone based upon adherence, but also has patient benefits to patients and caregivers where they can see the data as well and they can modify their behavior according to their adherence. But where this is becoming really invaluable, where artificial intelligence is being implied, is through the massive amount of data that is being gathered and subsequently pseudo-anonymized in individual patient devices that has been aggregated and then, uh, and then um, analyzed ac according to um, according to the pseudo-anonymized data. So here is an example where this data has been used, multiple millions of data points have been used to learn, to identify patients who are at suboptimal risk of uh, poor adherence, uh, sorry, at risk of suboptimal adherence. So you have here the mean adherence over the first three months, standard deviation away from the injection time, so not given the injection at the same time of day, the needle speed, the frequency of data transmission, and the age of start, all being predictors of poor or good adherence. So those with low age at start, those with low frequency of uh, data transmission with a specific needle speed, those that vary their injections at, uh, during the time of day, and poor adherence over the first three months are more likely to have suboptimal adherence subsequent to that first three months of injections. And here is a, an example where AI has been used for clinical decision support. So what the what has been proposed here is that the data that is used is subsequently fed back to clinicians in a meaningful way that they can understand what those patients who have poor adherence and those patients that have good adherence. So the machine is essentially analyzing the data around uh, patient adherence over a, a period of the year and then outputs that information in a traffic light way where there is a green light for those with good adherence and a, a red light for those with poor adherence. And you can see that on the left-hand graph and the right-hand graph, this is the traffic light system used for patients that have a high standard deviation away 
from a specific time of day for giving an injection. And you can see those with good adherence are given the green light, so their time for injection is at approximately the same time every day. Those with poor adherence or predictably poor adherence have an injection time where they give their injection at varying times during the day. So I'm just finally going to speak in the last couple of minutes about challenges with artificial intelligence. And as I've mentioned right the way through this presentation, that artificial intelligence algorithms in the era of narrow AI is absolutely dependent on data. And if the machine gets specific types of data, it will respond accordingly to what the data is. So for example, if patient data is not included, so for example, there is um, a homogeneous data set because actually there is only buy-in from a specific population, the machine will respond only to that specific population and they may bias the output, particularly against maybe ethnic minority subgroups or against gender or against age based upon what the data that's input into the system provides. There may be a specific data exclusion in the research study that would also generate the same problem. There may be categorical banding from stratification, which provides a uh, limited output from the data set, or there may be small numbers. It may be that this is a rare disease and therefore the actual inference from the uh, AI algorithm isn't sufficient to give you an appropriate answer and is biased towards, uh, towards its output. And we have the challenges there in the middle, which you see already the small data sets, the lack of population data heterogeneity and social inequalities. But it may be that research actually isn't good at reporting uh, data and that the information that you receive is extrapolated from adult data. Um, and it may be that actually those data sets are small as well, even in the adult data sets, so the, the data becomes biased still. It's important in the future that when we're using AI algorithms that they're safe, the efficacy has been proven, that they're reliable and they're context uh, specific to the age of the population. And we also need to think about the data privacy and compliance with regulations when we're using pediatric data. And there is a very good paper um, highlighted at the bottom there that proposes a framework, the Accept AI framework, as to how we should be considering our use of pediatric data in an era of artificial intelligence. And we're also moving out of a, an era where we're talking about opening the black box. There has been a real concern in the past where AI algorithms are poorly understood. And when the data does look biased or we're getting unusual output, it's very difficult to go back and understand what the AI algorithm has done because the computational science is so complicated. But now companies and organizations are talking about opening the black box, that we need AI data to be transparent and we need to be the, the process to be provable so that that data and the process is reliable in the future. And that's going to be very important how we use healthcare data in the future. So finally, one of the questions that's been asked repeatedly is, will AI replace doctors? And so what better way to do that than to ask an AI platform? Is artificial intelligence going to replace doctors? I asked ChatGBT, which is a familiar AI platform, and the short answer was no. It wouldn't replace doctors, but will play a crit critical role in augmenting the work of medical professionals. And what was interesting was the second statement, which doctors who embrace AI, AI will enhance patient outcomes, and those that don't embrace AI are likely to lag behind. And the, it, the important here is the collaboration between the human expertise and the AI capabilities. And what we'll have in the future is the ability to garner huge amounts of data, not just personalized data from omics such as geomic, genomics, transcript, transcriptomics, proteomics, but also exposomics, data from the environment that's gathered in the near patient environment in terms of use of drugs, physical activity and nutri nutrition, but also the wide environment to get all this data to create a digital swing to help us use AI to understand what happens to that patient or person in a specific environment and how we can change that based upon the modifications we make with the, the type of medications that we use. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. That was a relatively short run through on what is a, a very uh, rapidly advancing field. But the take home messages here are that um, in advances in AI are improving the way we deliver healthcare to children and young people across all specialties, not just pediatric endocrinology that AI has the ability to improve the identification, diagnosis, investigation, and management of children with growth disorders, 
that it can assist clinicians with decision support and harnessing real world data to stratify patients according to needs. And it is likely to revolutionize healthcare with challenges currently exist in the potential bias of using AI in certain situations. And the future of artificial intelligence and growth disorders will lie in the acquisition of credible data to support personalized, personalized healthcare. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.